All right, so for the purposes of the recording, today is Monday, April 22nd. It is the 2024 National Volunteer Week, and our very first 4-H Volunteer Lunch and Learn session is called Keeping the 4-H Experience Fresh. Um, thanks for joining us. I know many folks will be watching the recording, um, which is also great. Um, and as we get started today, I want to just launch um, a quick poll question um, regarding just uh, maybe a little bit about uh, what you're looking for today. Um, if you're just joining us, welcome. Um, thanks for being here. And uh, we are recording. All right, there should be a question on your screen. Um, that's, that question says, as a 4-H volunteer, I feel like I'm in a rut when planning 4-H experiences. Yes, sometimes or no. And then the next question is, um, as a 4-H volunteer, I like learning about ways to keep the 4-H experience I lead fresh. Yes, sometimes or no. So a couple of poll questions. Go ahead and, and answer those on your screen. We'll give folks a couple minutes to get those answered. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and show our results so we know what we're looking at today. Hopefully you can see um, the results on your screen right now. It looks like some of us feel like we're in a rut um, yet sometimes, and or yes, for the lucky person who says no, I want to know your secret. Um, and then we also say that you're always looking for ways to keep the experience fresh. Um, that is fantastic, you're in the right place. Um, so we're gonna get started. Um, I'm Jill Godekin, I'm the 4-H volunteer and professional development ed extension educator working with Nebraska 4-H. Um, I see some repeat faces that have joined us in the past, either at 4-H Lunch and Learns or during the 4-H Volunteer Roadshow. It's great to see you back here today. Um, I too am a volunteer. Um, I'm a 4-H club leader with about 55 kids in our, in our club. Um, and then I'm also a certified um, shotgun instructor um, with shooting sports too. So um, I, I love being a 4-H volunteer and I hope you all do as well. So let's get started. All right. If you want to put in the chat or you can unmute, uh, which picture resembles the 4-H experience you lead? So like the fresh bananas or the bananas that um, may have seen a better day. Which one do you think your experience might resemble the most? Okay, let's see here. A lot of fresh bananas, a lot of some older bananas. Melanie says she's hoping for the fresh option. Okay, thank you for, for popping in. Anyone want to unmute and share? That is just fine. You know, so think about these um, pictures of our bananas on the screen. Um, I'm going to guess that, you know, based on some of our responses that we might think, gosh, I really want my experience to be that fresh banana, right? That looks um, shiny. It looks new. It looks fresh. Um, but think about the idea that both of these bananas uh, on the screen, they have their own purpose. Right, so if you're going to eat a banana, you probably want the one that's on the left. Um, and if you want to bake banana bread, the ones on, on the right are just fine, right? And so when we're thinking about the experiences that we're leading as 4-H volunteers, it kind of depends on our end use here, right? So um, I think it's important for us not to uh, put a lot of pressure on ourselves um, as a volunteer to think I, I need to always have the best ideas. I need to have, I need to know everything about all the 4-H projects. Um, it's important to really think about, you know, dig deeper a little bit and say, all right, you know, what is that that end result that we're, we're going for? And just like our bananas that we have on the screen, the 4-H experiences that we lead, they have their own unique purpose. Okay, so let's dive into what that looks like. If you've just joined us, welcome. Thanks for being here. And we just got started. 
All right, so before we dive into some ideas here, I wanted to remind everyone um, that when we are working with 4-Hers and delivering a 4-H experience, there's some, really some four main things to think about here. Um, we're thinking about providing a place for youth to explore their interest or, or find their spark. I know that if I asked all of you to say, do you know a youth in your club or your group that has really found a spark because of something you taught them, right? If anyone wants to give me a thumbs up on their screen or on their video, that would be fantastic. Um, but we know that there's youth that have really found um, a place where they belong, which is the second part, right? Where um, they belong in your group. They feel like they're at home. They um, they like to maybe share things with you like, hey, I finally, um, I finally am able to, to do this skill or um, I learned about doing this new thing. And, and so they feel like they belong um, in your group. Um, the next thing is that we are emphasizing um, developmental relationships where that's for you. Um, as a caring adult, um, is really providing them with a caring atmosphere. You're challenging them to learn new things, um, and you're sharing some power with them, like business options and voting on business, coming up with new ideas um, to do with your group and things of that nature. And then, of course, we're engaging youth um, in a, a variety of dosage, meaning many times um, potentially intensity plays a part in that, and so does duration. I also wanted to take um, the opportunity to share with you all um, the newest research in positive youth development and what the 4-H program is built on, um, and that is called um, the 4-H um, thriving model. So when we think about a youth um, thriving, it's kind of like a flower. You know, it's, it's springtime, um, I hope you all have a greener thumb than I do. I'm trying to figure out why the house plant in my house is currently not thriving. Um, but you know, it's springtime and we're thinking about planting flowers and planting gardens and you know those kinds of things. And one of the things that we know those plants need is a really rich soil. So we think about the soil of a plant being down, whoops, down at the bottom where it says developmental context, and that's a 4-H program, that's where you as you and, and I as 4-H volunteers come into play, where we are giving youth experiences, a wide variety of experiences, for them to find their spark, we're giving them a sense of belonging, relationships, engagement, um, as a way to really have a, a rich, um, soil or a base to build upon um, so that we see that they're able to um, develop into an, a successful adult at one point in time. So that uh, developmental context is full of all kinds of 4-H experiences. I know that all of you, without even asking, you have youth in your clubs and groups that maybe have tried um, a variety of animal projects or a variety of um, maybe like static projects and, and to which some they've said, yeah, that's not really for me, right? And they've moved on to other things and that's okay. You know, that's part of having that rich soil um, for them to ultimately develop later on. So when you're thinking about your 4-H volunteer experience and you're thinking about, um, you know, is it worth it? Am my, I if I'm making a difference? And the answer to that is that you absolutely are because you're providing these rich experiences for them to thrive. So quick reminder about why our work is important um, before we dive into our content today. Um, so I'm going to be sharing um, five ways to keep the 4-H experience fresh. Um, and at the end, we'll have an opportunity for you to also share um, some of the ways that you keep an experience fresh. Um, and if you have questions, jot them down. We want to hear from you um, kind of in the second half of our time today. All right, so sometimes... It's easy to get in the rut of doing the same thing every year, right? And and that might be easy for us as a volunteer. I can guess that many of us are, we're, we're busy people. In fact, busy people make the best volunteers um, in which you um, probably have a job, you have a family, um, you have a million other things going on. So sometimes being into that same thing that we do every year is just easy, right? So how can we balance some of those kind of easy things 
um, with maybe some new things. Okay, so if we keep some of the experiences but add some new ones, that helps keep it fresh without having to redo an entire year of meeting ideas um, just by switching out maybe like half every year. Um, for example, um, it's also important to think about um, that it's okay to stretch our families, okay? It's okay to think about um, presenting new ideas. So for example, you, um, you may lead a group that's really focused on one project area that might be a special interest group. Like for example, um, you might lead a group that's focused on sewing. Um, and that's, that's great. You get together, um, you might sew and do some different things. Um, you might sew some things for others, for yourself. You might do a Quilt of Valor project, for example. But, you know, it's okay to stretch that out and think about, you know, what else could we do as a club? You know, is there something related to community service that might be a, a great option that is outside of maybe our the project area that we're working on, right? So if you lead a livestock club, is it okay to do like the foods project at a meeting? Absolutely. Everyone needs to eat. Um, and these are life skills that we want 4-Hers to learn about. So it's okay to, to stretch families and, and maybe not stay in that same exact um, focus area 100% of the time, right? So again, as 4-H volunteers, um, we are, we're, we're stretching, we're learning life skills, and that is a-okay. If you've just joined us, welcome. Um, we are just getting through our, our kind of our top five ways to make the 4-H experience fresh. And, and this was the first one. All right, on to the second one. Um, the next one I want to share about is called um, using the 4-H meeting wheel. And the 4-H meeting wheel is a wonderful tool in which you can use this in your own planning. So I, I just put the link um, to this resource in the chat. Um, this is a resource that kind of helps us gauge what are some things that we could do um, in our meetings and in our experiences that will keep it engaging and will help us just know what to do. Um, we might be a new volunteer and you might say, I'm a volunteer because I know it's needed. My kids want to do 4-H, but there's no volunteers to make it happen. This is a very basic piece of how to plan a 4-H experience. Um, and so you are encouraged to use um, two to three um, of the fun business or learning sections in which to build um, an experience from. So who has an example that they use when they're planning their own experiences? They can unmute or you can put it in the chat about how you've used this meeting wheel, maybe without even knowing it. Anyone care to unmute and share how they've used it? Or put it um, in the chat with Yeah. Jill, I'll just volunteer. This is Aaron from Badger yeah. Buddies. Yeah. Um, we, we don't really officially use the wheel, but our agenda is set up very similar to the wheel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Can you give us an example of, of how you do that? Um, a lot of times we ask for the kids and parents to pick the learning portion because they're the ones that are going to lead a presentation or a talk at the end of our uh, meeting or a project at the end of our meeting. So they do a lot of that planning for us. And then us leaders, we do the business planning. Fantastic, excellent. Thanks, Erin. And then Janine has in the chat that uh, we always have a business meeting to discuss, then two to three demonstrations per meeting and then refreshments and recreations sometimes project related, relationship building, icebreakers, or just fun. Great examples. Anyone else? Jill, this is Melanie um, in Saline County. And we have such a large club that I have found that it's really easy on the agenda to focus on those consistent things like the group building area, um, celebrations, and talking about what's going on in youth lives. Um, whether it be related to 4-H or not, 
um, just to kind of break the ice. And with time, everybody obviously gets very comfortable. But um, in a big group setting, that can be scary for some kiddos. So kind of unknowingly, we do spend time doing that. But then also um, with a big club, one of the challenges is to manage our time in a meeting. And so kind of unknowingly, we're using this program wheel. Um, and a lot of times we're using the entire meeting to do a service activity one month, mm -hmm. and then maybe yep. another another month we're strictly doing only demonstrations and it's a demonstration led um, meeting. Yep. And so it's just kind of how it breaks apart for us. Excellent. So there was three really great examples about how you can um, use the meeting wheel. And it sounds like a lot of you were using the meeting wheel without even knowing that you were using it, um, which is fantastic. Um, and so when you uh, need ideas, here's a wonderful resource right here. Um, if you're looking for ways to um, incorporate demonstrations, um, service, uh, speakers, you know, one of our last meetings that we did in, in my club um, was we, we elected to have the foods project as our club project for the year. Um, and then at our last meeting, we did a three rotation um, workshop um, where we did some hands-on food decorating, some basic measuring and, and cooking, um, and then a, a fun Kahoot game um, about some of the food projects. And so there's so many ways that, that uh, you can create a really intentional learning experience that it doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all kind of, kind of piece. So um, use these resources and those ideas to your advantage. All right, up next, um, something else. Um, so what's something that you can do to spice up your year is to think about the opportunities in your community, right? So a lot of you might be in some really small communities, and I know that new businesses don't always come to town, um, but if they do, um, and that could even not necessarily even be a new business, but it seems like more and more there are individuals who are starting their own kind of maybe side business in which they might be a wonderful um, tour that you can um, go and visit them or have them come to you um, to learn about what they do um, in their business. There's also, you know, community celebrations happening, right? So there's um, there's Bellwood days, there's Utica days, there's all of those kinds of days that are going on in which um, a lot of times they might need help, right? They may need a concession stand. Um, they may need um, someone to sell t-shirts. Um, they may need lots of things, right? Um, help with the parade. There's all kinds of things that a community celebration can offer in terms of uh, not only learning, but also service. Um, and then there's also the opportunity, again, depending on your community or county size, that there may be a drive going on for some sort of materials. Um, that might be a winter coat drive, a food drive. Um, you might even be able to serve a meal or honor an organization's staff, um, which could be uh, maybe the local Legion Club and, and honoring veterans or something of that nature. So um, sometimes, you know, think about some of those things and, and ask the youth in your club, you know, what ideas do they have along these lines? Um, they may know about something going on that you don't, right? And so um, ask them if they know of a group that might need help or something that is coming up that they really want to be a part of. All right, the next one is uh, regarding the uh, Pick a Project. And the Pick a Project is an opportunity for youth to see a variety of different projects in which they can do some searching um, on their own. Um, I just put a link in the chat with um, a place for you to do some searching about different project areas if you're not very familiar. You might also use this when presenting ideas to select a club project for your club to do. Um, does anyone do a club project with your with your group? Anyone want to unmute or put in the chat if they do one? Pamela, it looks like she's nodding. Thanks, Pamela. How do you go about selecting that, Pamela? Um, we kind of just based on the needs in our community or <clears throat> around. So uh, in our county, we have several towns. Uh, mm -hmm. So because we're so small. So we kind of just go on 
uh, the kids' interests and the things of what uh, maybe different uh, nonprofit organizations need. And then uh, we let the kids vote on what they want to do. But we talk about, you know, what are the possibilities, the timeline, the work, you know, where we have Clover kids all the way up to, you yeah. know, teenagers, how we could split all that up. Um, so, I mean, kind of a lot goes into picking uh, what they're going to do. But in the end, it's the kids that vote what they want to yeah. do. And then um, the parents just kind of help with the resources. Awesome. That is fantastic. Thanks, Pamela. Anyone else want to share how they go about selecting a club project? We uh, choose our group project by, I have the first meeting, we have roll call, mm -hmm. and I ask, the the question is, what do you want to learn in 4-H this year? Oh, awesome. And we require a uh, roll call to be answered uh, by, you have to stand up, you have to give your name, you have to answer in complete sentences, and... <laughs> To, to start working on public speaking always. And so um, so we find out right away what what they're interested in learning. And then, then we pick the majority rules and then that's where we pick the group project. I love that. And you know, right now we need to give Marsha a little round of applause because she is the zone nine outstanding volunteer award winner. So thank you, Marsha, and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. And then Marsha also put a comment in the chat too about using a guessing jar at the meeting for fun. Um, fantastic ideas, Marsha. Thanks for sharing that. Awesome. If you're a member of my 4-H club, you get uh, a couple of options. And one of those options for a club project is always the 4-H communications contest. Um, and when that happens, there's a lot of older kids convincing younger kids that the other options are better, but it's always an option, right? Um, it's something that everyone can do. It's a low investment. Um, and, you know, that's something else to, to keep in mind too, that um, a club project should be something that everyone can do. Um, and so something to think about there is just making sure it's achievable and not limiting for all of your club members. All right, club projects that have been super successful. Anyone wanna share something that's been easy, not, to, not easy, but it was maybe achievable for everyone in your group? I don't know how successful we were, but it was achievable. I know we got some red ribbons. <laughs> um, That's okay. But I am the least domesticated woman on the planet. And so as much as I love um, cows, horses, chickens, and all the things outside, um, my 4-H experience as a youth was founded on baking and sewing and things of that nature. And so um, last year, we tackled one of those projects in the sewing area. And it was something mm -hmm. super easy. And there was <clears throat> templates. And we had a couple moms that can sew, because Lord knows I can't sew, um, lead. And so there was skin in the game from a couple other kiddos that were already at the meeting because they had made examples. And so overall, oh. we all achieved our pin cushion because, um, like I said, there was the youth leadership that came with that. The moms mm -hmm. that were helping mm -hmm. were super mm -hmm. fun. Um, and I, for once, got to sit back and also learn with them. Um, because I haven't sewn a pincushion since I was approximately eight. Yeah. So awesome. all of them went to the fair. So that was good. Awesome. Very good. Very good. All right. Um, that's a great great example. Yep. Someone else was talking. I'd love to share my our group, yep. one of our group. We always do a group project, but one year we decided to do plant a uh, flowers. Mm -hmm. And so we all planted marigolds. Oh. And we uh, took marigolds to the fair. And every one of us got red. <laughs> oh, Marsha, that's a good one. <laughs> and and when we when we read the judge's comments, we honestly couldn't even understand what the judge was telling us. 
we, I mean, it was just so funny because we couldn't, we didn't even know what she was referring to when she said some things on our notes. So what we did about it, we, uh, we invited the county person who yeah. in charge of that to a meeting and we all brought our exhibits as what we thought was an exhibit, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we had her tell us what we did wrong and, mm -hmm. you know, what, what was a, a right exhibit. And so the next year, some, some, not everybody, I mean, it wasn't a group project the next year, but so not everybody exhibited, but a few of them did. And we got a purple mm -hmm. and we got a blue. <laughs> and so we learned anyway. And I, I right. felt, you know, some people were really disappointed, but, but uh, uh, it was a great learning project and we learned and, and we accomplished a lot. So it was kind of fun. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Marcia. That's great. Anyone else want to share? All right. I personally have had great success with the safety project. Um, that's easy buy-in on a safety project because who doesn't need a first aid kit, right? Um, I'm venturing to guess that you have a local nurse or a parent who works in potentially the medical field who might be interested and willing to help lead that about why you know each thing is important to have in a first aid kit. Um, and even some of our, our livestock kids um, made one for their show box. Um, we had people make them for their camper, just all kinds of things. It was an easy buy-in. Um, and then another one that was an easy buy-in for our group was veterinary science. Um, we toured just a variety of um, local producers, and that was just a really, really big hit um, for us. So great ideas, um, just ways to help keep it interesting and new and fresh. All right, next one. All right, so where do we find um, some curriculum pieces that might help you when implementing um, a 4-H experience? So there's a variety of things that you can use to shop from and look at different options. Uh, you know, not everything that you do in your group needs to tie to a, a county fair project for sure. Um, and so there are some that do and, and some that are great learning activities. So in the chat, I put um, in there just a, a link to the um, Shop 4-H mall. And there is a whole section on um, curriculum pieces. Some are actual books, some are downloads, um, in which you can um, use that to help guide some of your learning as well. Um, when we're thinking about using these curriculum pieces, um, you know, these are some easy go-tos for knowing that it's good quality, um, it's intended for youth of this age that you're working with. Um, there's just a wide variety of reasons why this curriculum is just a really great resource. Um, when you're using this, um, it's important to also know that, uh, again, <clears throat> they are age appropriate, they have been vetted, you know, you're not searching online and maybe wasting your valuable time in that way. Um, but they're really great um, resources for you to use. Um, we'll also put some links in the chat as well for some free resources that can be found um, in our 4-H um, volunteer links here towards the end. All right, so those are some five things that you can do to help make sure that uh, you're keeping your experience fresh, it keeps your families coming back, you have some intentionality to the experiences that you're leading. And we've been sharing kind of along the way, but I would also love to hear, um, even if you have an idea that you have in mind and you're just wondering if someone else has done that in the past. And so we're gonna open it up to just um, anything you want to ask um, and or something that you've you've done and it's just really great and you wanna share. I'll share. We um, had done that workshop with you, Jill. This mm -hmm. is Erin. And yeah. on making the wildlife tracks. Mm -hmm. And that seemed like a pretty easy one to do with a club. So we were trying to get a set of the tracks to borrow to use for mm -hmm. our club. And our county thought that it was worthwhile. They purchased a set. So now we've got that within our, our community. 
And it was really great because the kids enjoyed it. It was an outdoor activity. It was fun. They got to pick their favorite track. Um, we also paired that with a local resource. So my husband is a chair on the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation group. And they have a traveling trunk that is filled with all kinds of wildlife information. So it's mostly about elk, but it does have other things, deer. So it shows them tracks, it shows them sheds, it shows them a pelt, um, all of those kinds of things they can actually put their hands on and touch. So I would encourage you, you know, look within the park systems and some of those conservation groups mm -hmm. to see what they have that you can get for your, your club as well. Thanks, Erin. That's a great example of um, a new idea you learned from attending the 4-H Volunteer Roadshow um, last November and then expanded it a little bit. That's fantastic. Any questions for Erin? I'm going to just um, mention a little bit more about what Erin um, talked about. Uh, we did kind of an environmental education focus as part of the project training during the 4-H Volunteer Roadshow last November. And I have to encourage everyone to go take a peek at those environmental education um, classes and projects because I kind of, they kind of surprised me. I They weren't on my radar and I was kind of sleeping on them. Um, but there are super great ideas for um, you can actually plant trees as a starter and that's a, a club, it could be a club project and you can actually go to the, the fair. Um, there's also a project about planting a tree in your community. Um, obviously as the volunteer, you'll need to get, you know, the permission for planting trees and, and public property. Um, but there is um, a lot of really great um, new and different ideas that can be done under that environmental ed. So definitely take a look at that. I I definitely was skipping over that. And so take a peek. There's some very achievable um, club activities there. Anyone else have something they want to share about something they've done recently that was great um, or something they're thinking about trying? Well, we've had, uh, we haven't done this in a long time, but this year we um, started asking every family, uh, we have quite a few that have multiple kids. And so we just ask every family to bring, and we pick a exhibit from a cooking class. So we started with cooking 101 and we just picked like cookies and we'd say, and we just write what the exhibit is and then like in the in the fair catalog or in the ex yeah the fair book mm -hmm. and we just say okay so cookies pour on a plate you know use the recipe and then they're to bring that and then we judge them at the meeting and Ooh, okay and we talk about how we are not comparing them we have done that we have we've had we've had meetings where we like have four pairs of or four muffins and we compare them and you know good better best and all that and and rank them but we don't we're not doing that we are we're judging them and and that has been a good experience because um like in the last meeting we did we did muffins and there was clearly a purple winner. I mean, it was, it was a really nice tasting muffin and it was just great. And there was clearly a uh, red one because they hadn't followed the directions. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, okay. and so, so everybody learns something and nobody, uh, it, it hasn't been critical. It hasn't been, um, it hasn't come off as critical or negative in any way. It has been, and, and, and you're judging each one, not against each other, you know? Mm -hmm. So it has mm -hmm. been a good experience, um, so far, um, and, and so we're continuing to do it at, at every meeting. And when you only have to bring one per family, then that isn't a burden for people, you know, uh -huh. uh, it hasn't been. So that, that has been a good one. And that, that life challenge thing that we've been doing, that has, that has been a super exciting one because if we get, a, you know, the life challenge book, which has all these super experiences and then like we wrote we had to write a check last week the last at the last meeting and the girls didn't know how to write checks they had no idea well they had I had given them paper to study they could have known and and then they had to do it at the meeting and and then we got we laughed about it because I mean some of them were we, we could we could have written seven million on it you know and they, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so we laughed about it, you know, but so it was just a good, it's always been a good experience, every one of them, you know, that, to learn, you rank things, you do different things. Okay, we're learn to, we're going to learn to hand sew at the next one, because that's one of the challenges. And so, yeah, okay. it, it, it just been all like all learning experiences, just really good ones. So both of those have been good experiences. Awesome. Very good. Thanks, Marsha. Um, the Life Challenge is um, a contest that happens um, annually, and um, county offices will send that information out um, when it, the information is available. Um, I believe that now happens in, in December, right, Marsha? I'm not sure remember when that happens. It used to be in June, um, but I think it got moved to um, the fall. So if you're wanting more information about what Marsha's talking about, watch your 4-H newsletters and that information is shared that way. Great ideas. Anyone else? I'm going to switch my share here so I can... Um, go to um, another one that I wanted to um, share with you all with just a, a couple things about where resources are located um, and as an opportunity just to share a little bit more or a reminder about maybe where to find some things. Um, and so we're going to start off here. Um, I will put this link in the chat um, and there's just a, a variety of awesome resources that have been updated here um, within the last couple of years. Um, and so on this piece, um, you're going to find um, a wide variety of things that talk about, you know, a lot of you are past the charter and you're past, you know, kind of doing some of the basic things. Um, I know you're all well-versed in, in youth safety and, and screening and, and things of that nature. There's some resources here for 4-H Club Financials. Um, so if you need a reminder of, about what those rules look like and you need the end of the year treasures form, and they're right here. And then we get into some, what I like to call meat and potatoes um, of how this can work from a, a meeting perspective. Um, and when I think about this, it's really along the lines of just resources that you can easily print off, you can use um, in your meetings in an everyday kind of thing here. So there's a meeting script, there's the pledge, there's officers and duties, um, there's the guides for the different officer roles um, where you can find them, print them, watch a quick video if you're not sure. Um, again, these are just really basic things that all volunteers that are leading a 4-H club might find um, handy and useful. This next one about creating an engaging and encouraging environment, there's 4-H uh, games and activities, roll call ideas. Uh, Marsha had a great one, but there's some here to add. Um, here's some strategies to engaging parents that you might find helpful. Um, a parent interest survey. 
Camp. There's just lots of um, really great tools here that you might know didn't know exist. Okay, <clears throat> for youth engagement, here's that meeting rule wheel I showed you earlier. Um, the parliamentary procedure, um, basics, um, the activity that I know a lot of you have done with me with creating a snack mix using parliamentary procedure and some digging deeper pieces as well. Um, ages and stages is a piece we're doing on Thursday of this week. Um, and then also some community service types of things. So there's um, some really great options for you there if you're looking for um, things and ideas and resources for to print and to watch. And then I also want to show you an, another resource. Um, hopefully you're seeing on my screen right now where it says curriculum. Excellent. Um, so here are those links that I shared earlier, the pick a project, the where to purchase curriculum. Um, and then we get into some resources that are a bit free and available to you to use in any of your any of your 4-H experiences. So um, the Livestock Information Series has just a, a lot of different um, activities and things that you can use for your own uses. So there's meat science in here, um, a tattooing handout, carcass information, um, and making a marinade. So things are just different and new and things that you might not know uh, were there. Um, and then the next one is an online livestock judging series. So if you're working with youth who are doing livestock judging, here's a great online series that you can use, uh, you know, maybe in the winter when the weather's not great to be out um, on farms and things of that nature. <clears throat> the STEM at home um, piece was developed during um, the pandemic when we were at home and we were doing, um, you know, things um, virtually. There's great lessons in there that you can print off and use um, however you see fit. So here's some of the different things that are available there for you. Uh, the virtual field trips are awesome. I cannot even tell you how cool and unique some of these virtual field trips are. Um, they have, they kind of took a little bit of a hiatus, but they are back here in early 24. Um, these are all been recorded and can be used to share um, in your club. And, and these are really kind of geared um, more towards um, an older audience. So if you split up your group into older and younger, potentially due to size, due to learning activity, due to space, whatever that may be, here is some really great um, opportunities to um, show something in maybe ag-based if you're looking for that. Um, to an older audience, okay? Everything from taxidermy to um, growing sugar in Nebraska, embryo flushing, you name it, it's here, right? So so definitely um, a resource that you can use in your clubs. Um, a Clover Kid Corner, there's a lot of great opportunities here as well, just based on Clover Kids. Um, and so definitely check that out. Um, and then cooking with kids. Um, so fun, fun, easy recipes, um, physical um, activities in here. Um, and then of course, career exploration as well. So I wanted just to, to take the opportunity to share where those all live for you. Um, so you're able to um, just know where some, some new ideas, free resources live on the website. All right, and then here is that link in the chat as well. Other ideas, questions, <clears throat> things you're thinking about and want to try and want some feedback on. Jill, I had a South Dakota friend uh, do this with her club and I'd like to try it with mine but they mm -hmm. brought this big uh, bag of items mm -hmm. and each kid had to reach into the bag blindly pull out an item and then give a three sentence speech about that item oh I love that it's fun helping them with their public speaking skills mm -hmm. and thinking 
critical thinking and, and planning and things like that. So that one sounded like a fun one to try. Yeah, absolutely. Great idea. You know, with the, the mention of, of South Dakota, that reminds me that, you know, Nebraska is part of the north central region um, of the 12 states um, in this area. So, you know, north and South Dakota, um, Nebraska, Kansas. Thanks, Pamela, for joining. Um, Iowa, Missouri, Minnesota, Wisconsin, all of us, all those 12 states, we all have really great resources. So if you're not finding, you know, what you're what you want or what you're looking for, drop me a note. I'm happy to help or just maybe even check out their websites too. They've got some great things to offer as well. All right. Anything else that we want to share or ask questions about today? <clears throat> All right, we're going to go with a um, another kind of quick ending poll here. And uh, you should see a, a post um, on your screen um, that says, as a result of this session, I have new ideas to implement in the 4-H experience I lead. So give me your feedback there here as we wrap up day one of National Volunteer Week. All right, thanks so much for sharing. And it looks like everyone learned something new today, a new idea, a new way to approach our 4-H experiences. So thanks so much for um, sharing and, and giving us your feedback today. Um, today is just session one, um, which is exciting to get us kicked off. But we also have some really great sessions coming up later this week. Um, the one tomorrow is about working with youth with special needs. Um, I have two very well-versed colleagues in this um, topic from Minnesota joining me today, or joining me tomorrow um, for that conversation. Um, and then Wednesday, we are talking about leading a group with primarily younger youth um, and helping work through, you know, how do we elect officers when our group is all younger than 10? Um, how do we, um, how do we distribute maybe our learning and uh, maybe our leadership roles when, again, we're, we're pretty young group. So we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. Um, and then Thursday, we're going to do some ages and stages about knowing how to plan and, and work with youth of different ages. Um, so thanks for being on. It's the same link every single Lunch and Learn. Um, and you'll get a reminder every morning as well. So if you're not registered for all of them, just join us um, that is A-OK. -okay. And for those of you watching the, the recording, um, thanks for being here with us today. And again, thanks for serving as a 4-H volunteer in your local county and communities. Um, with that, we will finish up for today. Enjoy the rest of your Monday um, and hope to see you back here tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>